Welcome back, everyone. Um, next up, we have Richard Eisenberg. Richard is a principal researcher at Twig.io. His research is about how type systems can be used to reduce program errors, and in particular, uh, about integrating dependent types into Haskell. Uh, Richard is also a core contributor to GHC. Um, take it away, Richard. Great, thanks so much for that, uh, for that introduction. Um, it is fantastic to be presenting here at, at Haskell Love. Um, uh, it's, it's great to see an online first conference um, uh, in, in this space. I'm, I'm hoping that this is something that continues for years because I, it's, it's important that we, we sort of gather, gather more people together and sometimes it can be easier to attend an online conference. So this is fantastic. Um, so what I wanna talk about today is about all of the different ways that a Haskell function can take a parameter. Uh, so we're gonna sort of explore all of that. And um, it, the goal of all of this is to give, uh, I think, a better understanding of what it might mean to have something like dependent types in Haskell. And, and actually, we'll, I, will, I will claim that we already have dependent types in, in Haskell, but we'll, we'll see exactly what I mean by that a little bit later. Um, okay, um, you should all, I should also note that um, uh, I'll be doing this talk um, from uh, two code files. So most of it is this talk.hs file. There's also gonna be a little bit of Idris. Um, if you want to download them, you can access them off my website at this address that's highlighted for you here. Um, if I think this is probably gonna be recorded and available later, and then available later, you'll be able to access it from, um, from this page. Um, also, I should say that those of you attending live, oh, uh, thanks for posting that in the chat. I can actually see the chat on my other monitor here, so do feel free to ask questions during the, during the talk, and I'll try to address them when, when I see them. Um, okay, so let's, let's dive in. Something was supposed to happen there, but didn't. Uh, let's try this, there we go, okay. Um, so uh, so what, is a, what is a parameter? Um, uh, and it's, it's something, a parameter is any input to a function that's gonna somehow affect that function's behavior. So here we have the definition of const, um, and we can ask how many parameters does const have? Right, it, it looks like it, it just has two, and, in, and indeed, oh, th there we go. Um, indeed, if I say, I could say const true x, and that does something. I've only, it only looks like I've passed two here. But I'm actually gonna claim, no, it doesn't just have two. It has four. It has two type parameters and two value parameters. So when I say type parameters, really when we, when we write a type signature like this for const with A and B being these type variables, implicitly, we really have for all A, B here. So, so GHC very cleverly just inserts that for us. Uh, and we can see that if I, if I recompile the file, it's taking very long. Uh, if I recompile the file, um, then, then, we can, um, then we can see even with my for all AB that this works. And in fact, when I call const, I can choose to pass these parameters explicitly. So I can say something like this, and that will work. And now we can see that I'm really passing four parameters to const. Okay, so now let's look at shout here. So how many parameters does shout have? Um, well, it, it, again, it looks like it just has one, but uh, we see here it's just like const in that there's a type parameter. So there's definitely at least two, but I'm gonna claim that there are actually three parameters to shout because it, shout also takes a class dictionary. And this dictionary um, tells us how to render this parameter at runtime. So in particular, if I shout false, um, then we need to know how to turn the Boolean value false into a sequence of characters, F-A-L-S-E. And that's what is passed in as this second parameter. Um, so in fact, when we compile Haskell down to uh, GHC core, uh, these dictionary parameters become just very routine, ordinary um, arguments to the function. Um, and that argument in this case just contains the function that renders bool to string. Um, okay, so, so we've seen that there's, there's already sort of quite a bit of, of different kinds of parameters, and this is very Haskell 9080. Um, um, you know, I've, I've written for all A here to be explicit about it, but we don't, we don't have to, of course. Um, so, so we've seen three different flavors of, of parameters. 
right? We have type arguments, we have class dictionaries, and we have what I'm calling regular arguments. Um, so I wanna, I wanna pull these, these different flavors apart and talk about three different qualities that we might describe a, a parameter with. So a parameter can be dependent. In other words, that parameter can, or the choice of that parameter can affect the types of later arguments to my function. It can be relevant, which means that the information is needed at runtime. And it might be visible or invisible, which is whether or not we need to pass it explicitly. So here's a little table describing these arguments. Right? The type argument is dependent because it affects later arguments. If I say something like this, um, I'm going to get an error, cannot match int with bool. Right? Can, I get, can I get everything on the screen at the same time? I can't. Right, because I've chosen int as the type argument to shout, but yet I've provided a bool. So in that, that's what I mean by dependent here, is that the choice of this first parameter affects the type of later ones. Is it relevant? So relevant says, does it affect the way the function behaves when we run it? Um, and so for both class arguments and regular arguments, the answer is yes. Right, a class argument is going to affect its runtime behavior because again, we're passing this dictionary. This is the function that changes a bool to a string. Um, or uh, uh, the regular argument, uh, of course, is going, to, is going to affect things. If I pass true versus false to a function, we're gonna have different behavior. Um, we can also ask, is an argument visible? So in other words, must I pass it when I call the function? So regular arguments, yes, are visible. Class arguments are definitely not visible. And even though I've written no here for type arguments, um, it turns out that what we can do, is, as we've seen already, is we can override that choice. So we can almost think of this at sign, not as let's pass a type argument, but let's make an invisible argument visible. Um, and, that's, and that's really what it's doing. I, so I sometimes wanna call that a visibility override. Um, Okay, so I see a question, but then it says, don't want talk to be interrupted. So I will perhaps return to that at the end. I will respect that, that don't want talk to be interrupted. Okay, so we have this information here. Um, uh, and, and so I'm gonna just rearrange it. And we wanna look at all of these different possibilities. So I've described that we have relevance, visibility, and dependency um, as three different qualities we might ask about. So actually we have eight different possibilities and we've explored three of them. Um, so so as, as summarized here in this table. And much of this talk is going to be about filling in what these question marks should really be. Um, so although we will return to the table, I, I, wanna, I wanna start by pushing on uh, relevance and irrelevance. So here we have the definition of id. So let me just recompile, make sure that we're all in sync here. Um, and, and this works just fine. But as, as we Haskellers know, uh, I, can, I, I can't rather write an equation like this. If I try to compile, then I get and get some error. Could not match expected type A with actual type bool. A is a rigid type variable. Uh, what, what, what this error message is trying to say is that I've described this id to work for any type A but now I'm, having, I'm saying, oh, it's gonna have very special behavior just for bulls though. Uh, and I can't do that because the way that Haskell understands this is uh, that we can only work for, um, uh, or, or rather we erase this type information. This type information is irrelevant. So we can't then say, oh, I'm gonna use a special case for bulls here, right? So, uh, so we can't do this. But it turns out other designs of a language could do this. Uh, so let's, instead of looking at Haskell, which makes this a bit awkward, let's jump over to Idris. So here's Idris, right? Idris looks very similar to Haskell. Let me change this. So I'm actually using Idris 2 right here. Um, and so this setup is very much the same. If I reload the file, we see that it works. If I uncomment this line and try to reload the file, I get, um, I get an error just like I did in Haskell. Um, but Idris allows us to very easily quantify a dependent argument, like a type, um, as, uh, as also relevant. So if I just write this here, the braces mean it's still gonna be invisible. But now, whoops, what have I done? 
There we go. Um, now this works. And indeed, if I write in true here, we get we get false back. And this is because what I've done is by adding this extra little piece here, I've made my my choice of a relevant, which means that on this line, there's actually an invisible pattern match that checks to see is A actually bool? And then if it is, then the rest of this line makes perfect sense. Um, okay, so that's that's pretty cool that we can do that in Hedros. Um, and it just shows that this notion of irrelevance does is not incompatible with this idea of it's a type argument. Right, they're really quite separate ideas. Um, okay, so let's let's summarize where we are. So in Haskell, all type arguments are irrelevant. Another way of saying this is that Haskell supports type erasure. Right, we don't want our types around at runtime, which might slow our program down. We don't want that. Um, so other languages make a different choice. So Java in particular does not have type erasure. We can ask, what is the type of something at runtime? But that means that we always must know our types in Java. So this information has to be propagated at runtime. One of the nice things about Haskell is we don't do this. Um, in Idris, we can decide the relevance of each parameter separately. So the initial version that didn't have this A colon type piece um, well, it just has a convention that if we don't explicitly bring something into scope, then it's brought it uh, into scope irrelevantly. And that's why the initial version failed. But once we, once I then explicitly bring it into scope, even if it's embraces, now it's, it's, it's relevant. Um, we'll actually return to this and play around with it a little bit more later. Um, Okay, so I, I see there's stuff happening in the chat. It's, it's gonna, it would take me too long to sort of catch up, but if there's a question that's phrased to me that's sort of toward at the bottom, I will try to do it. It looks like people are, are asking questions about, that, about it on the side. That's great. Um, okay, so how can we do this in Haskell? Well, it turns out Haskell has a feature called typable, uh, and typable allows runtime type identification. So here I have my same id that wants to do this true versus true, that changes true to false, but keeps everything else the same. And the difference is I've changed the type, not only to take, uh, or rather the type of weirded, not only to take a, take a type argument, uh, but also this typable a constraint, which means that the, the, the type of the choice rather for a is going to be preserved at runtime. And it means that we can make runtime decisions based on it. The details of, of this kind of gobbledygook, I'm not going to get into. Um, uh, there's a paper I wrote a few years ago uh, on this, so you can check that out. There's a link, link right down here. Um, but, um, uh, but, but suffice to say is that we can do this, but only because we have made this available at runtime. So uh, let me load this. And then now I can write weird it of true, and indeed that's false. But if I do weirded of x, I get x back. Um, observant, read, observant watchers will see that, um, that I'm avoiding numbers because they're overloaded and cause weirdness with, um, uh, with type inference sometimes. Um, OK, so, so again, I, what I've done here, the key point is I have made this relevant so that I can now do strange things like change true to false in, in an id-like id function. Um, okay, so so some of you might be asking, oh, why do we need this, right? So what I've really done here is, let me go back a slide. Um, what I've really done here is made relevant dependent quantification. It's dependent because I can mention A later in the type. And it's relevant because I'm passing this typeable A dictionary. So this is relevant dependent quantification. Um, so, so why do we even want that? Um, it's, it's, it turns out to be quite useful once we start using fancy types. So it would take us too far afield in this talk to really explore sort of why we might want to do this. But if we use, I'm just going to show the rest of the function here. Um, if we use relevant dependent quantification and we use fancy types, we can gain more static guarantees about our program. So the type defined in this slide is a length indexed vector. Functions that work over length index vectors then can have a compile time guarantee that they either preserve the length or double the length, sort of depending on exactly what we want to do. But it means that we have a compile time guarantee uh, about the length of a function that works on these length index vectors. So that gives us greater um, confidence that our code is correct. Um, so the, the, the key function defined here is replicate. Right. Replicate is just like its list version. 
right? We want to take a value and have n copies of that value and build up a vector um, uh, built from n copies of, um, of that value. So this is a case where we need relevant dependent quantification. It must be dependent because the result depends on our choice of n. It must be relevant also because the runtime behavior of my replicate function depends on this choice, right? If I pass in two, I'm only going to get two items in my list. If I pass in five, I'm going to get five items. And, and indeed, this, this really does work. I can call replicate, if I uh, replicate true, and then let's have three. And sure enough, I get three copies of true, right? So, so we can see that this really is needed at runtime. Um, I can also use a visible type application here if I wanted to. Again, the way that this is implemented is, is very yucky. Oops, my slides have, have moved around. Um, so the way that, um, that it's implemented is, is, is definitely a little bit ugly here. Um, and that's because I'm using typable. Another approach would be to use singletons here. But it turns out we don't need singletons. Typable is enough for relevant dependent quantification. Um, it just means that it's a little bit painful. Uh, to, to, to work with. Um, and there's weird completeness checker things that I don't want to get into right now. Okay, so now having mode, done a little bit of motivation, I want to actually return to, to sort of this weirded because that, that's quite a bit simpler. Um, so I see a question here actually. Can we interpret typable as I don't want parametricity? Um, if you want to interpret it that way, yes, that's, that, is a, that is a valid way of, of seeing it. Um, if you have a typable constraint, you do lose parametricity. Um, okay, so what we've done just now is we've added one new entry to the table um, right here. So now we can be relevant, invisible, and dependent by using typable. But as we see, there's three stars over there to the side because it's ugly. So we can do it, but we don't really want to, and we certainly don't want to do, it, do a lot of it. Uh, we'll return later to how to make this less ugly. Um, so one might ask, OK, so now that we've done relevant, invisible, dependent uh, parameters, can we do relevant, visible dependent? Um, and so, so uh, some of you might know about type rep, which is kind of like typable, but it's more explicit. And indeed, I can write a version of weird id that takes type rep instead of a typable constraint. Um, and now when I call weird id2, uh, then I have to pass in this type rep. But, but actually, it's not really much more visible because, as we see here, um, I can write these versions. And instead of writing car explicitly or bool explicitly, I can just write type rep and let type inference do the rest. So this is a bit more visible, but it's a bit of a red herring. It's just, I think, a common one that people might, might think of using at this point. Uh, so, th so if this doesn't really allow us to do the visible quantification that we want, um, uh, what we really need is built-in visible dependent quantification. So here's a version, weirded three. But if I uncomment it and try to compile it, we see an error. Illegal visible dependent quantification. GHC does not yet support this. So what have I done? What's, what, what's the illegal bit? The illegal bit is this arrow right here. Um, so this arrow is saying that this for all argument is dependent, but the for all says that it's dependent, but the arrow says that it must be visible. So every time I call weirded three, I'd want to pass this. But as we see, it's not implemented. Well, it's not implemented in terms, but it is implemented in types, as it turns out. Um, so here I've written a type family equivalent to weirded three with its standalone kind signature that looks like this. Um, and uh, I can very happily match against bool and then do different things for true that, uh, that I do for every other argument. Um, so if I load this, now it should load successfully. And with the kind exclamation point command in GHCI, I can evaluate uh, type family. So I can say weird id three bool true, and it's false. And I can weird id three of, I don't know, a symbol hello, and that's indeed hello. Um, 
So one weirdness about this is that according to the way I'm breaking down parameters here, um, uh, this parameter should be irrelevant, right? I, I don't have a typeable constraint. Um, it turns out that GHC is, is not very clever about this. All, all quantification at the kind level in GHC today is relevant. Um, and, and this, in my opinion, is, is, a, is a bug in the design and one, one that I'm hoping to, to, to sort out in due course. Um, but it's, it's a bit frustrating here that, I can, that we can't really quantify irrelevantly in, in types. Okay, so now let's go back to our big chart. Um, so our big chart, uh, let's see, now we've filled in this row. Um, so this, we have this for all A arrow, um, uh, and we have typable. So here I now have stars and these little um, carrot marks um, and saying that it's both ugly and not implemented. Uh, but even if it were implemented, it would be ugly. So it's, it's still not quite the solution we want. Um, but at this point, I've talked a little bit about types uh, uh, separate from terms. So let's, let's jump forward a little bit. And now we can look at having a difference in types. So here in types, we have relevant visible dependent quantification. That's for all A arrow. No type of all needed. And it's not particularly ugly. It works really quite well. Um, here, we can, um, in types, of course, we can take regular arguments. That's no, no problem. Um, here, arguments can be relevant, invisible, and dependent. As I said before, everything in types is relevant. So we don't need the type of all A constraint. Um, uh, and here, um, we, we can imagine having class dictionaries in types, but we see the little carrot marks over there because this is also not implemented. There's some level of implementation this, of this for um, equality constraints, but, but not beyond that. Um, and then of course, down here, I'm not even writing the in types bit because it takes up precious room on the screen. Um, and there is no irrelevant quantification in types. Um, so I see a question, uh, which is what is a kind argument? Um, perhaps I should not have even said kind argument because since GHC 8.0, um, kinds and types have been the same. So we can think of kinds as the, um, uh, the classification of types, but, but actually types are really just classified by other types. Um, and so kind argument is, is, is probably, I should have just said dependent argument in a type would be a little bit better. Um, so, so another question that I see here, what is the difference between for all a dot and for all a arrow? Um, so actually, let me go and demonstrate that really quickly here with weird id3. Um, so here I have for all a arrow, and when I call weird id3, I have to pass the type of this argument, right? So here the type of hello is symbol, and so I have to explicitly mention symbol there. If I change this to dot, then that means that this parameter becomes implicit. And so if I, oops, something I've done wrong. Oh, um, so now I can call oops, weird id3 of true and it will return false or weird id3 of hello. Oops, oh. Oh, I didn't do the kind exclamation point, and it will return hello. So that's that's the difference. It's just whether or not the parameter is visible. So let me undo those changes, although I don't think it really matters for the rest of the talk. Okay. Um, okay, let's plow forward. Um, so there's two lines left that have that have question marks in them. Irrelevant, visible, non-dependent, and irrelevant, invisible, non-dependent. But here, both of these are both irrelevant and non-dependent. So if it's irrelevant, it can't be used to compute the result. And if it's non-dependent, it can't be used in the type. So these are useless. Um, so I'm just gonna say we don't care about these spots. Um, so now we can go back to our table. No more question marks. We filled it all in. Um, and, and, and here we have it. So now I want to turn to trying to make this a little bit um, easier to use. Uh, oh, whoops, sorry, I forgot one step. So uh, linear types fresh in, in the next release of GHC and actually in the version that I have running in, in my window below, um, add multiplicity. 
Uh, so the idea here is that my x parameter must be used exactly once in the output. If I don't use it at all, I get an error. Um, and similarly, if I mark b as a linear argument, and I, and I now don't use the y, the, the value of type b, I get an error. So this is, this is no good. Um, so we could, we could think about, we can now worry, okay, so we have eight entries in our table. Um, I mean, only six that are interesting. And now do we, do we get 12? Do we have to double because all of these are either multiple or not? Um, no, this only affects relevant, visible, non-dependent parameters. Maybe someday we'll expand beyond this. Uh, but right now it only adds complication to that one spot. Um, okay, so now I've updated the table. And so here we have linear and actually multiplicity polymorphic arguments, uh, which I'm not gonna get into in this talk, uh, but I wanted to, to include them in the table. Um, so an interesting thing is with, though with multiplicity is that multiplicity says essentially how many times we're using an argument. Well, linear types as they're implemented today supports two possibilities, one and many, um, where many is really unrestricted. It could be zero is, is, is one possibility for many. Um, but we can imagine a, a, a third uh, multiplicity, zero, where zero says it's not used at all. So that's the same as irrelevant. Um, so um, does this work with Haskell? I think it does. So there's a, a recent paper submission that I've posted up on my webpage right here uh, that shows how we might adapt this idea from what's called quantitative type theory um, into a Haskell setting. Um, and it's, it's basically a generalization of all of these ideas that we already have, uh, a in particular a generalization of linear types as they exist today. Um, so we can pop back over to Idris and I said over here, if I quantify, then it becomes relevant. But actually, if I just stick a zero there um, and now switch back to my Idris and try to reload, I get cannot match on true as it has a polymorphic type. That was the same error that we had when I didn't quantify over A explicitly at all. Um, so uh, so that's, a, uh, that's an interesting thing from Idris and we're hoping to eventually adopt the same idea in Haskell using multiplicities to talk about relevance. Um, and I think that this has an opportunity to really simplify things because it means now multiplicity and relevance are not two separate axes, but actually the same. So that's a good thing. Um, some of you who've been watching this line of work may be also familiar with the idea of matchability. Um, this has to do with type inference in the presence of unsaturated functions. Um, it's very cool stuff and it essentially takes all of these categories and that really does multiply them by two. Um, but because we don't really have unsaturated functions yet uh, that can appear in types, uh, I don't want to get, in, I don't wanna get uh, involved with, with matchability right now. Uh, but if you look at other materials, this is why we have the 12 quantifiers of dependent Haskell. I saw someone mention that in the chat. Um, and, and it's the six that we've seen times two for matchability. Um, okay, so let's, let's return to these ugly, uh, these ugly lines and how can we improve that? Um, and I have proposed for each quantification as an alternative to for all. So this code is commented out because we don't have an implementation of it yet. Um, but the idea here is that if for all means that we bring something into scope such that for any choice of that, for all different possible choices, we're gonna treat them the same. Well, and for each is, well, we can do a different thing for each one. So in my weirded for, I treat bool differently than all other possibilities for A. Um, in here in replicate, I treat all different possibilities of nat, what number we're getting as different. Uh, so that's, that, that allows us to pattern match on it. So here I'm also using one of these visibility overrides in an argument. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the time. Uh, things have gone a little slower here than I'm hoping, but I'm, I'm quite near the end. Um, so um, instead of for each and for all, that was the original idea, but now maybe multiplicity is the way to go because this is really about relevance. Um, I haven't yet worked out that syntax, so that would be a fun thing to, to explore a little bit. Um, so, okay, returning here, uh, I've now added a few new items. So in the future, we want relevant dependent quantification um, to use for each. And now can I, I can't make that any smaller, but maybe I'll just get rid of that little window because my slides are getting bigger and bigger. Um, and so that's not implemented, but in the future we'll have something like that, or maybe a different syntax now that we're thinking about multiplicity. Um, okay, so the conclusions here, 
Um, Haskell already allows parameters of many flavors. Um, the move to dependent Haskell, really the only thing that, that we need to do to get dependent Haskell is just to decorrelate these choices, to allow us to have visible dependent quantification with ease. Um, uh, so that's, that's really the big step that we need to take. But um, as we've seen, using typable, we can actually do all the dependently typed stuff that we want to do. We can do it now. It's just really ugly. Uh, and I think this is part of the reason why some people say, oh, why do we use something so complicated like Haskell? Um, and it's because the support for dependent types, it's there. And so enterprising programmers reach for it, but then it just becomes very painful. Um, so another, another interesting conclusion here is that this irrelevant quantification is really the same as the zero multiplicity. Um, so there's, there's more to explore there, um, and I, I haven't really focused too much on this point in this talk, but I do think that there's a, this a promising direction uh, for the future. Uh, so I think uh, with that, we're at the end, and, and thanks very much. I look forward to answering your questions.